No matter who you are or where you're from, we want you to experience God and experience friendship at Go Church. We hope you enjoy today's message. As I was preparing this message, I was getting a flashback. So when Becky and I first moved to Colorado from Oklahoma, we moved into a two-bedroom apartment right down on 29th Avenue. Why? Because it cost almost the same as our four-bedroom, all-brick, three-car garage house coming all the way from Oklahoma. That's really the rule. If you leave Oklahoma, it only goes up does not go down with the cost of living, goes up. So we moved here, cost of living goes up. So we get this two bedroom apartment right in the building where Cold Stone Creamery is. Raise your hand if you know where that is. You know where the Cold Stone is, I bet you do. Mm -hmm. My ministry expanded during that first year. We were living there, right above Cold Stone, top floor. And it was fun. I mean, really, we had me and Becky and then our three kids, Sydney, Ethan, and Levi, two bedrooms. So all of the kids were into this one bedroom area and they actually had a lot of fun and it was a very, very interesting kind of year to a year and a half until our house got finished up. When we were living there, our very first winter here in Denver was pretty cold. You know, in Oklahoma it gets cold. We get the ice, we get the wind, but here in Denver it was cold, man, that first winter season. And it was so cold there was a guy, a young man, that was homeless that would sneak into our building. And he was doing this for three or four days and he was sneaking in because it was just so brutally cold outside and he would come in and he would sleep on the bench in the lobby. And so we had seen him do this a couple of days and Becky and I wanted to do something to just encourage the guy, man, that's cold, that cannot be a comfortable sleeping position, just do something to elevate the spirits, warm the heart, warm the body. So you're like, you know what, one morning, we got up and we decided to do something just nice to try to make him feel a little encouraged. So I got the coffee grinder, I filled it full of the dark, dark, dark roast Starbucks beans, grind it up nice and fresh, French, press it nice and strong, put it in my favorite best Starbucks tumbler. I was just going to give the whole thing to him. But Becky, my wife, she goes over the top as I'm making coffee, she's starting to make cinnamon rolls. I mean, the kind of cinnamon rolls that are like borderline sinful, ooey, gooey, butter, extra cinnamon, extra love, extra, all the extras, man. Like she gets this whole thing going, rolling them out, getting them all ready. She puts them in the oven and then it starts to bake. Have you ever made cinnamon rolls like in your house and it just starts to fill, right? Fill the apartment. I dare say maybe even go beyond the apartment, just starting to circulate throughout the building. So I'm standing there with my coffee. I'm like waiting, waiting, waiting. And for some reason, she's going to give all of them to this guy. I'm like, are you sure you don't want to spare it? Maybe just, maybe just one or two for, for the kids, for the kids. She's like, no, no, I'm going to go all of them. So she packs them up. It's all nice, all pretty, all packaged. And so we go downstairs. The young man is there. And we just introduce ourselves, you know, hi, I'm Nick, and Becky introduces herself, we live upstairs, and, you know, we just exchange a few little pleasantries, No, it's cold, just wanted to bring you something that would, you know, warm the spirit and encourage you today, and so I kind of extend the tumbler with the coffee, and he's, he's looking at the tumbler, but then Becky comes in strong with the cinnamon roll, and she, she cracks the top a little bit, she's like, and I made you, she's like looking at my coffee, like, he just made coffee, I made some cinnamon rolls. And so she cracks the top of that thing open and it's just like the smell, the steam is coming out. I'm like, I want that cinnamon roll for myself. She's extending it to this man. He kind of looks at the cinnamon roll. He looks at Becky. He looks back down at the cinnamon rolls. (laughs) I kid you not. The young man looks at Becky and he goes, are those Cinnabon? <laughs> Becky. <laughs> Becky. She's like, she's a little confused. She's like, well, no, but they're fresh. He's like, I'm good. <laughs> He's good. It took everything I wanted to die laughing so hard. I'm on the inside. I'm like, 
He said, it's good. Yes, it's so cool. I'm just trying not to die. And so Becky's like, okay, well, have a good day, you know. So she carries the cinnamon rolls, and I've got the coffee, and we, we are making our way back up to the apartment. I'm just like dying laughing. I'm like, so babe, do you think I could, uh, could I have one now? She's like, well, they're not Cinnabon. <laughs> the problem was like, you know, we thought we knew what this young man needed, and then we got Cinnabon. And sometimes it's like that with people in your life. It could be somebody you meet one time or maybe it's a perpetual needy person in your life and you think you know what they need sometimes and then you get Cinnabon, you try to be nice, you give emotionally, you try to do something and it's not the right thing or it's not the right time. You try to be nice and it just doesn't work. Now I want you to think about not the people that you see every once in a while or the equivalent of maybe the guy who is sleeping on the bench in the lobby. Think about the people in your life that are consistently overly needy. Think about that person. The person that asks you for things a lot. The person that's always needing another pat on the back again. Always needing an affirmation. Always needing another attaboy. Maybe they need $100 here, $300 there, a little help with rent, a little help with life. Watch the dog, watch my kids. Can you watch my husband? Can you check my packages? on and on and on, not occasionally. I'm talking about the overly needy person in your life that is pretty consistent. Sometimes if you get a text message from them or a call, you're like, here we go. Right, here we go. I can feel it coming already. I want you to think about it. Could be a family member, could be maybe somebody at work, could be a neighbor that's just perpetually kind of asking you, asking you, asking you, how should you be? How should you respond to the overly needy people in your life? We're gonna get this figured out. So I want you to think about that person. Maybe think about a face in your mind, a person in your life as we move through this message. Now we are calling the overly needy person today a relational vampire. Why? Because they want to suck your blood. They want to take their little fangs, put it right into the neck of your life. Suck out energy, suck out maybe faith, suck out optimism, suck out focus, and their need never ends. So in this series, Relational Vampires, we have been talking about different types of people. So last week, we talked about the overly critical person in your life. That's right, we talked about your mother-in-law last week. It happened. If you missed it, jump online, check it out. Next week, we're going to finish this series by talking about possibly one of our favorite types of people, the hypocrite. The hypocrite. They say one thing, and then maybe they do another thing. It's going to be a great message. I'm excited about that one. If you think you might show up for that one, can I see a hand in the air? You show up for the hypocritical message? Mm -hmm. We'll see. We'll We'll see. If you don't, it'll be online. Which leaves us with today. Today, as you have guessed it, we are talking about the overly needy person in our life? How should we be? How can we love them? How can we serve them? How can we live around them? How can we live maybe with them? We love our kids. How do we teach them to be responsible, help meet their needs, but also help them take charge of their life? I want us to get some traction on this today. Grab your communication card, write this down. Our one big thing, one big thought for today. Sometimes what people want isn't what they need. And it's a tough truth with the needy folks in our life sometimes. Sometimes what people want isn't what they need. So how should we respond to overly needy people in our life? First thing, write this down, right underneath your one big thing. Here's the very first kind of action and thought about this question. How should we respond? Write this down. Number one, we will give strategically talking about the overly needy person in your life, not every need or maybe in the moment needs, but the overly needy person in your life. We will give strategically. It's easy sometimes and maybe easier sometimes to give emotionally, like the coffee in the moment or the cinnamon roll in the moment. You think you know what they need, you give emotionally, and then you get Cinnabon. Maybe you hit the nail on the head, maybe you don't. Sometimes it's easier to give emotionally and just check it off the list. Well, I did something good. 
I gave, it's just in the moment, boom, it's done. I'm gonna move on to the next thing. Today, I want us to dig deep, find a layer of discernment and kind of mix that with discipline and set our minds to not only giving emotionally, but also being willing to give strategically. Sometimes what people want isn't what they need. Are we willing to give them what they need, even if it's unexpected, even if it's hard, even if it's a tough truth or tough love? Now, I want us to look at a moment out of the Bible where you see this in action, giving strategically. Now, here's the moment. We're in the book of Acts. These guys are the first followers of Jesus. So Jesus had come, lived his life, given his life on the cross, died, been resurrected from the dead, ascended into heaven. That's a lot to say in two sentences. And now the first followers, his disciples, were leading the first church, leading the early church. Now two characters we will see, Peter and John. They lived life with Jesus. They lived life with with the master. So now they are in leadership positions, men of influence in the early emerging church, and they were on their way to worship at a Jewish temple. That was normal for them. They would get together and the believers would go to Jewish temple. They would worship. So they were on the way to temple and on the way they would pass through this gate. The gate was called beautiful, the beautiful gate or the gate beautiful. Now at the gate, It's kind of similar to today's time. You know, sometimes people who are in need or who are going to ask for money, they pick that smart intersection or they pick that smart strategic crossroads, right? Where people are passing all the time and they camp out right there and boom, they're going to make their ask and they're going to make their presentation. It wasn't much different then. There was a guy who was lame and every day people would bring him to the gate beautiful and he would ask for money. So here come Peter and John. This guy is already at the gate and we see something very interesting happen. Look at Acts chapter three with me. When he saw Peter and John, he is the lame man. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. No surprise. Verse four, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. I'm kind of imagining in my brain, I occasionally have a weird brain, but I'm imagining kind of like that, that parental like laser look, like like eyebrow maybe raised a little bit. This is Peter and John looking at this guy. I'm feeling like kind of parental laser beams coming out of the eyes, looking at him like intently, right? Peter looking at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. By getting this guy's attention, got the raised eyebrow, look at me. I think this guy, in response to Peter and in response to John, was like, oh, this might be a big one. I mean, they're really getting serious about this. Getting my attention, look at me. They're looking at my situation. I mean, they might really throw down some stuff in my box, in my hand. This could be a big time money moment here. So he is looking at them and look, the Bible says expecting to get something from them. Expecting something from him. He came every day, asked for money every day. Here we go. He's asking again, expecting Peter and John to give him something. And then look at verse six and Peter kind of flips the script. Maybe he disappoints this guy in the moment. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. He's like, sorry, buddy, I'm out. I got nothing. Silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand. You know, I imagine him reaching down, grabbing this man's hand, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. Now, when I point at you, I want you to say, helped him up. Are you ready? He helped him up. He helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. It was just a great challenge to me in reading this story and thinking about this, thinking about my life, and I wanna pass that challenge along to you. How many times in our life do we just give a handout? Oh, here you go. To that person in your family that needs something, again, here you go. To that friend in your life, 
The things they know what they need, here you go. Here you go. Guy on the bench, here you go. Kids, here you go. You need this again? Okay, here you go. Hand out, hand out, hand out, hand out. You're just giving hands out. I'm challenged, man, as I was putting together this message, thinking about this. Instead of going through life, being open and just giving handouts, I'm not shutting it down, but maybe I need to open up my mind, and maybe you do too, to be willing to give a hand up. A hand up. Instead of just a hand out, a hand up. Taking people where they are, helping pull them from where they are into a new place. They might think, your kid might think, I need a new game. In fact, I need a new gaming system. I'm out of date. I'm falling behind the times. I need a new game. I need new shoes. Maybe they're like, that's what they want, but what they need is to do some chores, to clean the house, to do the little jobs, to learn a sense of responsibility. Maybe that person in your life who again is wanting your validation that pat on the back, that encouragement. Yes, you're doing a great job. Maybe they want validation, but what they need is to discover their identity, their identification in Christ. Maybe your friend, here they come again, money, I need some more money. Can you help me with this? That family member, I need some more money, can you help me out? Instead of money, giving them a handout, maybe they need a hand up. Maybe they need you to take a step and say, you know what, I'll help you out. I've helped you out in the past, but as I do help you out, I want to talk about where you're at. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to go? Where do you see yourself headed in six months or a year? Have you discovered your identity in God? Have you met your maker? Can I pray with you? Not just a handout, a hand up. Are you willing to do that with your kids, your spouse, your family, your coworkers? Not just hand out, but hand up. We will give strategically, not just emotionally. I think sometimes it's easier to just give emotionally. Let's be disciplined. Let's mix that with discernment and be willing to give strategically. Number two, write this down. We will give wisely. So with the overly needy people in our life, again, hear this in context. I'm not saying that we need to apply these ideas to every single need across the board, but to the overly needy relational vampire in your life, We're going to give strategically. We're going to give wisely. Now, how many of you would agree with me by nodding of the head that you think Jesus was a giver? Was he a giver? Was he generous? Yeah? I totally agree. It's not a trick question. Totally agree. Jesus was a giver. Jesus helped. Jesus healed. He extended his hands. He was willing to be interrupted. He would travel to people's homes and help them in their homes. He raised the dead, healed blindness, cast demons out of people, walked on the water, multiplied food. I mean, Jesus was a giver, giving of his time, giving of his life, ultimately. Jesus absolutely was a giver. God, his nature, is a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave. The nature and the character of God is love. It's not that... God does loving things is that he is love. He equals love. Unselfishly choosing for the highest good of another, giving, 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 giving. Do you ever feel like you give and you give and you give and you give, especially parents with young kids, moms, mamas with young kids, you give and you give and you give and you give, and that's just to your husband. You're just giving and giving and giving, and then the kids come. Giving, 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 You give to a place where you start to feel a little worn out, depleted. It feels like I'm giving, 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 getting nothing in return, and you start to feel drained. Well, this was something that Jesus also encountered, and I want us to see this dynamic in the book of Mark. Check this out. This is Jesus. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark. Everybody say dark. Dark. Now, look, if you're maybe like a high school student or a college student, there's this thing that happens every day. The sun actually rises. I know you might not see it, but it happens. It just happens early, okay? You sometimes forget. When you get up early, it's dark. Jesus getting up 
early while it was still dark. He got up, he left the house. Sometimes, parents, you know that you got to leave the house. Like you just got to get out. Jesus leaves the house and he goes off to a solitary place where he prayed. Verse 36, Simon and his companions went to look for him. They're trying to track him down. Where do you go? Where's he at? We need him. Things are going on. Verse 37, and when they finally found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. We need you. Need, need, need. We need you. And Jesus has been like, can I just get a minute? Like just a minute. I got up before all y'all. I got up. I got up early. I left the place. And he left everybody else to go spend time with his father, to recharge his batteries. You can't take care of everyone else if you don't take care of yourself. Jesus knew this. He had to minister from a place of health. You have to have something to give when you're ministering and giving to others. We can't give out of lack. We can't give out of nothing. We can't give out of being just extremely tired all the time. We'll reach a place of burnout and breakdown. Jesus knew this. He prioritized time with his father. And you see this pattern. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus would do this a lot. I was kind of wondering, again, in my strange brain, like, I wonder maybe what Jesus said or what he thought or how he felt when Simon and all the guys showed up, you know? Right in the middle of prayer, maybe. Maybe right in the middle of a moment of worship, feeling close to his father, and here comes his spiritual children. You know what this would be like? This would be like... All of the young moms, right? The young moms, you get this. You just need a minute. It's been crazy. Kids have been all over you. So what do you try to do? You try to go to the bathroom. That's all you want to do. Just go to the bathroom. And you go into the bathroom. And you shut that door. And you are bold enough to even lock that door. And you try to do it quietly. Because you can't let the little beast know. That you're going to the bathroom. So you sneak in. You bring your phone. You're like, just a moment. I'm in the bathroom. Lock the door. And you're in there like, what, six seconds? And you start hearing the little beasts in the house, like chirping, Mom! Mama! Mama! Starts to elevate, Mama! And they've seen this before, so they start looking around. They know kind of where to go. And you even went to that other bathroom, try to sneak. Well, they track you down. They come to the door, try the handle, locked. You're trying to be quiet. Maybe they won't know. Maybe they won't know. They start to paw at the door. They stick their little grimy fingers underneath the door. Mommy, are you in there, mommy? You're like, can I just get a minute? Maybe you make it through the kids. Right now, I'm seeing this happen in my own house. When Becky gets a moment, she goes to the restroom. It's not the kids, it's the dog. The dog is now tracking her down, pawing at the door, trying to get underneath there, seeing where mommy is. Dog's at the door. Now, if you get past the dog, then it's the husband. Hey, babe. Babe, have you seen my keys? Have you seen my sunglasses? Have you seen the remote? Can I go golf? <laughs> Mom is in the bathroom like, I just need a minute. Just a minute. Not even two hours. Just a minute. I imagine Jesus maybe having kind of this feeling of like, I just get a minute. He goes back, of course, gives the love, brings the love, brings the support but he does it out of a place of being recharged and being strong. This is like when you get on the airplane, right? And they make the announcement. The steward or the stewardess is up in front and case of loss of pressure in the cabin, an oxygen mask will fall from above. Take your oxygen mask and what do you do? Tell me, what do you do with it? Or you put your oxygen mask on first, right? And then pick your favorite kid and put it on them next. That's what they say. You've got to put on your own oxygen mask. I know it sounds kind of weird or maybe counterintuitive, but you cannot do a good job taking care of everyone else all the time if you don't take care of yourself. And so this is a challenge to the married folks, to the folks who have friends, maybe to a team. Maybe you're here today, you work together. Look for times and rhythms of life. If you see a team member, you see your spouse getting a little worn down. It's been tough. It's been a rough patch. It's been a tough season. Volunteer and say, you know what? I got the kids. I got the dog. Go to the restroom as long as you want. Go somewhere else. Go take a walk. 
Go get a manicure. Go play some golf. Let's try to step in and bring each other up, but do it out of a place of strength. How many of you guys, you, you like a good baked sweet treat? Is there anyone here that likes that besides me? Can I see? See, Hannah, think about cinnamon roll stuff, yeah? There was this, there was this baker and this baker was like phenomenal, phenomenal baker. Not, not super well known, but locally, everybody knew who this baker was. He would bake the sweetest of treats. Think Cinnabon elevated. <laughs> elevated. He's baking, baking, baking. People lining up before the sun even comes up. Waiting in line every day. And he is just a baking machine, man. Just cranking it out. Working and working and working and working. Lines, lines, lines of people. Every day, every day, every day until it's sold out and gone. And then here comes the next day. Well, everybody was shocked to find out that one day the baker died. Out of the blue, he just died. Like, how did he die? Come to find out, he died of starvation. Always feeding everybody else, never feeding himself. It's easy to become a starving baker when you're raising kids, first five, ten years of your marriage, startup, business startup, at work all the time, trying to get it off the ground. It's easy to get into a zone where you're giving and giving and trying to take care of everything and everyone else until you finally one day realize I'm about to die myself. Challenge to you today, never be a starving baker. Give out of excess. Don't give out of lack. So it's imperative that every week you find some time, get in the presence of God, have a devotional time, read the scriptures, plug yourself in the community, go to life-giving environments that fill you up, find a hangout, grab a coffee or a drink or a meal with a friend, talk about the Lord, talk about what God is doing. That time in the morning that you spend with just you and the Father, praying, listening, reading the Bible. You might be here like, man, if you knew my schedule, you would know I don't even have time to do any of that pray stuff, any of that read the Bible stuff. I mean, it is just go, 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 go. You're too busy not to pray. The decisions that you have to make, the teams that you have, the kids that you have, the marriage that you have, the relationships that you have, the decisions that you might need to make that day, they're all too important not to pray. You need to make time, not just find time. You need to make time because the decisions are too important. You've got to make the time to come into your environment charged and ready to go. We are going to give strategically. We are going to give wisely. How can we do this? I want to give you the one big action for today. Write this down. We will trust God completely. In our giving, I believe, is implied trust. We will trust God. God completely. There was this thing that was happening with the first church where some of the new believers, they were making a big deal about the Apostle Paul or about another teacher, Apollos. They were trying to argue like, oh, Paul is better. Oh, Apollos, he's better. And so Paul was writing to the Corinthian Christians about this idea. And he writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want us to look at this. Paul talks about his role the role of Apollos, and the role of the Lord. And I want you to see some personal application with this. Paul writes this, I planted the seed. Planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. I'm not talking about like literal seeds. We're talking about metaphorical spiritual seeds, okay? I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Help me with this. Who makes things grow. God is the one who makes things grow. So there is some level of responsibility in our life where we need to be mature and say, I will plant the seeds. I will water the seed. I will extend and make an investment. I will put something into the spiritual ground. And we have seeds in our hand. We do. We have seeds in our hands. We have seeds of time. I'm going to give time. I'm going to plant my time with my family, with my kids, my loved friends. 
Dear colleagues, people around my life, I am going to be a person that will invest time and listen, invest my life. We can make more money, but we can't make time. Time is the currency that our kiddos value. I have time in my hand. How will I invest it and plant it? But when we do, we plant it in faith. So we have to understand that, yes, we have seeds to plant, seeds of time, seeds of talent, strengths that God has built into us that we can use to help other people, seeds of finances we can give, we should give, we ought to give, God challenges us to give. But everything that we do in our giving, I think, is an extension of faith. See, because it's not my job to change you. It's not. It's not my responsibility to change this community, to change your mind. It's not even my responsibility to change my family, like to make them do certain things all the time. I can't take responsibility for their own free will. Now I'm responsible to be a godly father, godly husband. I'm going to do everything I can to bring influence, but I'm not going to absorb somebody else's free will or take it away from them because God doesn't even do that. We have a responsibility to plant the seeds, but it's not our job to change other people. Not your job. It's not your job to convict other people of sin. That's not your job. It's not your job to transform people, change people, save people, heal people, redeem people, give people purpose. That is not your job. That's the Lord's job. Your job is to love them. Your job is to serve them. Your job is to lay your life down on the line and say, I will do anything to help connect you to the purpose giver, to connect you to the life giver. We give, and in our giving is implied trust and faith. We have to have enough trust in God that God can do it. I mean, think about that tough family situation. Maybe that person that you don't think will ever change. I mean, maybe you've tried everything and it just feels like never, ever, ever. Is this ever going to change? It's easy to give up, or it's easy to feel like it's my job to make the situation change. It's not your job. Your job is to be responsible for you, your decisions, your own free will decisions, and to plant seeds of trust, knowing that God can make a difference. God can make that marriage grow again. God can bring reconciliation between a husband and wife. God can bring reconciliation between you and your kids. Maybe especially if your kids are grown-up kids. You've got kids that are 30, 40 years old, and maybe you feel like you've become distant, or there's strain, or there's tension, and you feel like it's never going to come back together. God can do it. Don't stop planting those seeds of love, of patience, of perseverance, of listening being willing to serve, unselfishly choosing for their highest good. Yes, sometimes we need to give in the short term, but let us be willing to give strategically and to give wisely to understand that we need to give out of a place of excess. We need to give out of overflow, not out of lack. I mean, think about the people in your life that you love to death, your best friends, your first kid, <laughs> your first kid, your spouse. Maybe there's just a family member that is so near and dear to you, just the people that you have in your life. Think about if you would find some progress in your life, put one foot in front of the other and to start giving strategically. Maybe God would give you a glimpse into their life. Maybe you could see prophetically into their life. Maybe God could help you understand what they need. And it might be different than what they want. The man wanted money. And he ended up being able to walk back to his house. And not be carried back to his house in this story. I think we should give finances. I think we should give our time. I think we should give our talent. But more than anything else, we should give away the gospel. Give away what God has done in our life. Give away the purpose that we found. Give away the identity that we have found in Christ. Give away the direction that we have found in Christ. What God does in you, he wants to do through you. Allow him to do it. Are you willing to give strategically, wisely, 
Are you willing to trust God again? Maybe you've given up. Maybe you've given up planting those seeds because you've been burned, because you've been hurt, because they did something to you that they never should have done. And it might be true. But let us be a people that would place faith over fear. That we would place trust over pain. That we could stand before God at the end of our days feeling like, you know, I've done everything within my power to love and to serve and to plant seeds. I've trusted you, God, to make them grow. Let's pray. God, I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives, God, with this message of truth. Your word. God, help us to give away your spirit, your purpose, and your direction. Help us to be truth tellers. Help us to share the light that is you in our life, the gospel. God, help us to find a new willingness to plant seeds of love and service in the lives of the people that we love and even into the lives of people that are hard to love. The overly needy people, God, give us the wisdom to give strategically, to give wisely, to completely trust you in the process. God, I pray for all my friends today, God, all of our relationships, the people that they've been thinking about all day, maybe that face of that overly needy person, God, we pray for them. We pray for them, God, help us to do our part to connect them to you. God, and as we pray, I hope that you would Help us to understand once again how needy we are of you. If you're here today, it doesn't matter if this is the first time you've ever been to church in your life or this is the 1,835th time you've been to church in your life. I want you all to understand that you're welcome here and we are all needy people. We need the Lord. The Bible says that blessed is the man who is poor in spirit, which means blessed is a man who understands his need for God. We need God. Why do we need God? Because we were born into a problem. This is a problem that we were born into. The Bible says that we were born into the problem of sin. We were born into the problem of doing things that hurt the heart of God. We fall short. We fall way short of God's holiness, of his standards. And we need help. We need redemption. We need saving. And that's why God loved you enough to give his one and only son. Jesus came to this earth and he lived here 2,000 years ago and he lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. Perfect, blameless in every way. He was the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and he laid that life down. He gave his life on the cross and they stripped him And they brutalized him and his blood flowed for me and for you. And within his sacrifice, we find life and purpose. He hung on that cross and he died. They put him into a Roman tomb one day, two days, three days. And then God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, raised him back from the dead. And Jesus is alive and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And it begins with a relationship with you right now. Do you know him? Or have you just heard some things about him growing up? Do you just know some things about his life in your head? Or do you know him in your heart? How do you know if you know him? Do you live according to his commands? Are you connected to him? How can you be? The Bible says that if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if we will believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And I wanna give you an opportunity today to pray that prayer with me right here right now. If you want to make Jesus the Lord and the leader of your life, pray this with me right now. Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. I ask that you would forgive me of every sin. I am making you the Lord and the leader of my life. And I'm going to live for you the rest of my days. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now that anybody looking around just between me, you and the Lord, you prayed that prayer today and you meant it. Could I see an unashamed hand in the air? Say, I prayed that prayer today. Yeah, I see you and you and you and you and you. God is amazing. What a great response to the gospel, what God's doing in our heart. God is amazing.
Can we put our hands together and declare it? God, you're good. 